Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you again. Welcome to all of our visitors. Hope you'll be back often, again and again. Over the years, I've been a little bit unclear in my mind when you come to the Lord's Prayer, and we say, Our Father who art in heaven, understand that, hallowed be thy name. I've always, I understand it at one level, but there's a part of me that never quite closed where that is concerned. And it led me to wonder if it is somehow connected to the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Hallowed be thy name. Recently, I've also been thinking about covenant, and it occurred to me that the fact that my wife, by covenant, has taken my name, therefore everything she does, she does in my name. She can actually even conduct business in my name. Now, if I work my way around the circle, I come to the importance of the care and respect for what I do in his name. The question is, can I compartmentalize my life and say, well, now this over here doesn't have anything to do with God, and this over here I do in his name? I don't think so. I think that when you are in covenant with Christ, just like man and wife are in covenant, Everything you do reflects on the name. Now, this has to be considerably more than a matter of how we pronounce his name or even knowing what it is in Hebrew or Greek or English, for that matter. It's more than pronouncing the name in Hebrew. I know this, if for no other reason, that not one of the New Testament writers makes use of the Hebrew names for God anywhere in the New Testament. Then there is this. Just like in marriage, we can only carry God's name if we are in covenant with him. And I honestly think this means more than most Christian people believe. I think that we sort of think we sit on one end of this matter, that God has handed this over to us as a a gift, which indeed justification is a free gift, but that there is no obligation that comes with it. Now, every one of us know when we get up to get married, The guy makes vows, the girl makes vows. We all know that. And therefore, we fully understand that both husband and wife carry obligations in this marriage. Now, those obligations may be determined by a state marriage contract, which is a marriage contract, by the way, your marriage license is. And uh, the problem with that is the state could change the law, and thus your marriage covenant has changed, or your contract has changed, uh, because it determines how con- how property is distributed, where what happens to the kids if you divorce, and all kinds of things that are rather unpleasant to contemplate. But when we are in covenant with Christ, it's permanent. That's where we're going to be, and it doesn't change. It's not here today, gone tomorrow, it's something else entirely in a few days. Now, the covenant of God with Israel was like a marriage. I say that carefully because sometimes I've actually heard terms in the past that said that it was a marriage. I don't think so. I think what the covenant with God was was like a marriage. Marriage is used as a metaphor. God speaks of divorcing Israel using that metaphor as well. But it is all a figure of speech. The reason why marriage and this covenant with God are so similar is they are both covenants. And consequently, they have the same elements that walk through them as a marriage would be between a man and a woman. It works because the, 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 the relationship that we have with Christ is a covenant. It is, I fear, all too easy for God's people to make assumptions about their relationship with him and to carry on through life ignoring it, perhaps even ignorant of it when they have made it. You know, because when I put you under the waters of baptism, I would ask you, do you, have you repented of your sins? Your answer would always would be, yes, of course. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord, your Savior, your soon coming King? And we think we need to change that soon coming to your King and High Priest. And you said, yes. Now, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord, you have obligations to him right there on the spot. And when you come to the Passover service and we pass around the wine and we say, where Jesus said, take it, drink it, 
This is my blood of the new covenant. We enter into blood covenant with Jesus. And it has very stringent requirements of us on his side and on our side. And they're all laid out there in that marvelous long speech of Jesus at the Last Supper. So that's something to think about. Now I want to take you back to the, to the first chapter of the book of Malachi. God is, to put it mildly, very annoyed with a certain class of people. He said, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, said the Lord. And you say, Well, wherein have you loved us? I don't see that you love me. I can't tell that you love me. Look where I am. Look what's happened to me. Look at how bad my life has gone. How can you say you love me? And God says, Well, it wasn't Esau, Jacob's brother. Yet, saith the Lord, I love Jacob. I hated Esau. I laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom, that's Esau, said, We're impoverished, but we're going to return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They will build, I'll throw down. They shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord has indignation forever. Now, you know, this is a little hard to get your mind around. But when you see what's happening here in this, in this discussion between God and Israel, I have loved you. You say, well, why aren't you loved us? He says, take a look at what, how I have treated Esau. I have loved you. Esau, I have not loved. And I have said to him, you can build it back up, and I'm going to take it down. The border of their wickedness and the people against whom the Lord has indignation forever. Yes, I have become angry with you. Yes, I have chastised you. But my chast- my anger toward you will wane, and you are not going to be people against whom my indignation and anger will burn forever. Your eyes shall see, and you shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. And then there is an appeal on God's part to the relationship which was created with Israel by covenant. And happened at Mount Sinai when they said, whatever the Lord says, that we will do. A son honors his father, a servant his master. If I am a father, where's my honor? If I'm a master, where's my fear? I say to you, O you priests who despise my name, Here comes the name of God into the equation, which we started out asking. What exactly does it mean? Hallowed be thy name. You say, well, wherein have we despised your name? Now, what's interesting is it has nothing to do with the language they spoke or how they pronounced the name. In fact, we are told explicitly how they despised his name. He said, you have offered polluted bread upon my altar. And you say still, well, how have we done that? Have we polluted you? In that you say the table of the Lord is contemptible. Well, how does that work? You offer the blind for sacrifice. Isn't that evil? If you offer the lame and the sick animal, isn't it evil? I'll tell you what. You offer, make that offering to the governor. And let's see what he thinks. You take the governor a blind animal and see how he receives it. Take him a lame animal and see if it's good for him. And yet you think nothing of bringing one here to my house, offering it to me. You know, when you think about this, it shows a complete contempt for the sacrificial system to bring a marred, blemished, blind animal in there to offer to God. It shows that you really don't believe that he's there. And that was where their problem was. He goes on to say, Now I pray you beseech God, and he will be gracious to us. This has been by your means. Well, you think God is going to regard your persons? Who is there among you who would shut the doors for nothing? What he's basically telling these men, these priests, is, you're doing the things like that you're doing here strictly for because it pays you to do them. Anyone who would ask you to get up and close the door, you wouldn't do that for nothing. It's a really extreme statement. You don't kindle a fire on my altar for nothing. You have to get paid. I have no as the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. 
You know, wives don't get paid for cooking meals for their family. Husbands don't get paid for providing for their families. These are responsibilities that we bear because of the relationship that is there, because we are in covenant with one another. Children are born into that covenant, become a part of that covenant. He goes on to say, For from the rising, or basically he said, I have no pleasure in you, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. For from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. All right? If my name isn't going to be great here, I will tell you that from way over this direction where the sun comes up to where the sun goes down, my name is going to be great everywhere. In every place incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the heathen. Now, that's really a striking statement, because a lot of those heathen wouldn't have even known his name. And yet they may have feared him. They may have feared him because of the way they've seen that he was with Israel, the way he fought with their armies. When David went into the field, the whole world began to realize that David did not go into the field to do battle before he had consulted with God. And when he had consulted with God before he went and God directed him to go, Israel won and Israel won big. So, yeah, they feared God from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof. Then he goes on to say that you have profaned it. Profaned what? My name. How exactly have we done this? By not pronouncing it correctly? I don't think so. It's another thing in all together. In fact, we are explicitly told how they profaned it. You have profaned it in that you say the table of the Lord is polluted. The fruit thereof, even his food, is contemptible. You're not happy with what I have given you as your portion. It goes clean back to Eli and his sons who had to have exactly the choice pieces of meat and were not satisfied with that portion of it which God and his law had given them for their service. Now he says, you just it's not good enough for you. You also said, oh, what a weariness is it. And you have snuffed at it, says the Lord of hosts. You have brought that which was torn and the lame and the sick, and thus you brought an offering to me. Do you think... I will accept this of your hand, says the Lord. Cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and vows and yet sacrifices to the Lord a corrupt thing. You know, it's one thing if you don't have it. But if you have it and you make the vow and then you bring another animal that's lame, sick, or blind. He says, I am a great king. My name is dreadful among the heathen. You know, it seems that we profane God's name, not by the way we pronounce it, but by giving him less than our best while we carry the name. Think about it. We carry his name. We are in covenant with him. And he expects of us at all times our best. And that's how you can pollute his name. Then there is the question of uh, whose name perhaps we bear. Revelation chapter 15, verse 1. John, by this time his knees are probably getting weak. He said, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name. Now, I don't know exactly what to make of that. We all know about 666. We all know that that's the number of the beast and so forth. And it's almost as though what you're reading here is that there is a number that is a code of the beast's name. It isn't so much whether the name is in Latin or in Greek or in Hebrew or in some other unknown tongue. Once it is numbered, we know who this person is, and it is who the person is that is the name. You've gotten the victory over this person and over the number of his name. They stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great! And marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, 
Just and true are your ways, you King of saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? Now here we, I think, we come passing back by the question of the Lord's Prayer, and hallowed be thy name, when he says, Who shall not fear you, and glorify your name? For you only are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments are made manifest. After that I looked, and behold, the tabernacle, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. But by the way, the testimony of God is the Ten Commandments. You can do your own little concordance search to demonstrate that. But the Bible speaks of the testimony. It is talking about the Decalogue, not something else. And here we are, this late in history, all the way down to whatever Revelation is on about. It opens up in heaven, and here is the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony that's in heaven. Now, earlier in Revelation, chapter 11, here are the four and twenty elders who sat before God on their seats. They fell down on their faces and worshipped God. And they said, We give you thanks, O Lord God, who are and were and are to come, because you have taken to you your great power and has reigned. And the nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, that you should give reward to your servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear your name, small and great, and should destroy them that destroy the earth. So we have people who have taken upon themselves really the name or the number, which means the name of the beast on the one hand. And on the other hand, we have those who fear the name of God, who hallow the name of God, who respect the name of God, who glorify the name of God, who carry the name of God. He said, the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark of his covenant. There were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and gray hail. And if you know your biblical history, what was in the ark? The two tables of the covenant, a pot of manna, and what else? Oh, good. Lots of people know that. Aaron's rod, the one that budded. I suppose something like that is in heaven. Now, Something happened in the news just recently. Muslims have replaced the old pulpit in the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Did you catch that this last week? It, had, it got burned back in a fire that took place some years ago when one fellow, an Australian fellow, I think made a serious mistake and attempted to bomb the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And they rebuilt that, that pulpit, and they have put it back up there in that place. And they have boasted themselves at this point that the Jews will never return to the Temple Mount again. It's ours, they say, we're going to be keeping it. And they may not know it, but what they're doing is challenging God to show who he is and that his name is not Allah. They have basically thrown down the gauntlet to God by moving into that space, by controlling that space, banning Jews from it, and by refusing to allow the Jews to rebuild the Temple in a place that's not really the same anyway. It's where the, I think it's not where the Al-Aqsa Mosque, it's not where the Dome of the Rock was. What's going to happen one of these years, you know, is, is, is going to be seen, because I just don't know how long God is going to allow people to stick this sort of thing in his face. And it's not wise, it's just not wise to challenge God. One of the kings of Syria did that once. He actually came down, made all kinds of snotty remarks, the best word I can think of for them, about the God of Israel. He can't save you. He can put God down over here. Here, he said, I, look, none of the gods of all the rest of these nations has ever been able to stand up against me. What in the world makes you think your God can stand up against me? Made a big mistake. Big mistake. Because God was really, really willing to chastise Judah about this time and might well have allowed him to do it. But once he had made that challenge, it couldn't be allowed. This was when King Hezekiah went in, took that letter, spread it out before God, and said, here is what this man is threatening to do, and asked God to. I think that is really a fascinating uh, story, because what it says on this occasion is, God sent word back to him through the prophet, and he said, because you asked me, I'm going to do this to this man. In other words, it was the request 
not merely sticking it in God's face. It was the request that was made that caused him to thoroughly and soundly defeat the Syrians on this particular occasion. I used to wonder, really, about the Arabs. The Hebrew word for God is Eloah, which is not very far at all from Allah. And I wondered if Ishmael being a son of Abraham, maybe once upon a time God sent an angel to Muhammad to turn the, the Arabs away from their idols, because Mecca at that time was a Mecca for idolatry. The Kabbalah in, in Mecca had, was just full of idols, every kind of idol that you can possibly imagine. And along comes Muhammad saying an angel has spoken to him and revealed to him the name of Allah and so forth, and he came through and uh, abolished idolatry in Mecca. And he did fairly well as long as he was in Mecca. But he moved to Medina, power went to his head, and a lot of stuff began to change. If it were so once upon a time, the Arabs no longer worship the God of Abraham. Rather, they worship a God of their own making who is completely different. They have no graven images, but that does not mean they are serving the same God. For one thing, they have abandoned the law of God for Sharia and Jihad. And this is one of the ways you know who God is, by his law. And you can't remake the law. You can't toss the law away. And if you wanted to find all sorts of violations of the law that Abraham obeyed among Islamic peoples, you'll find them far and wide. You'll find them being taught by imams in their mosques and in their synagogues. Now, returning to the idea of polluting God's name, of people who actually do know it, Ezekiel chapter 36. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Wherefore, I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed in the land. Notice what comes first. God is furious with them because of their violence. They have killed and killed and killed. And it isn't they're killing overseas in battle. They're killing at home. Murders at home. You do realize, don't you, that we're killing far more people in this country every year in murders than are getting killed in Iraq? It's just the way it is. We are a violent people in this country. I know you're not, but your neighbor, who knows? Anyway, because of the blood they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through all the countries. According to their way, according to their doings, I judged them. And when they entered unto the heathen, where, whether they went, they profaned my holy name when they said to them, These are the people of the Lord. Think about that. They were carried away into captivity. They're in a strange land. They said, well, we're the people of Jehovah. And God says that when you carry my name like that, you profane it. So I begin to think a little further about the meaning of hallowed be thy name. Having to do with the way we live our lives, the way we conduct ourselves, so that we can't say to people, well, I'm a Christian while we are conducting our lives in a way totally counter to anything that Jesus taught, whether we're doing it in his face or in your face, whether we're doing it by neglect or whether we're just going along with whatever is going on around us. You can't say these are the people of Jehovah. Not when you live like that. They have gone forth out of his land, but I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen wherever they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I don't do this for your sakes. I'm doing it for my holy name's sake, that you have profaned among the heathen wherever you went. How did they do it? Well, they did it by their conduct as a people who carried God's name. You know, you think about this. You know, you reach back in the Old Testament, you kind of maybe be a little dismissive of what happened back there. But God has not changed on any of this. And he is not amused when we carry his name or the name of his son and call ourselves Christians and live like anybody else would live. Not in the least. I will sanctify my great name, verse 23, 
which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen will know that I am Jehovah, says the Lord God, when I am sanctified in you before their eyes. I will take you from among the heathen. I'll gather you out of all countries. I'll bring you back into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be free from your filthiness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. The interesting irony here. The Hebrew word for idols in this place is the word for log, as in I threw another log on the fire. That's the word God chooses to use. Since idols were, for the most part, wood, they were in God's eyes just another log from the fire. Thus, the irony. All your logs that you carry around with you. There's so many places where there's just drips with sarcasm when God talks about their idols. You know, he says, you have to carry these things. They can't even walk. You can only, And you expect that idol to deliver you from trouble that you have to carry? It's really something. He goes on to say, I'm going to also give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And therefore, be worthy of carrying my name. Now, what you're reading here is a startlingly new covenant idea, isn't it? In fact, if you want to study it more carefully, you go back to Hebrews chapter 8, where he talks about the covenants and how they work. Later in the chapter, he will say this. He'll say, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Hebrews 8, verse 10. Hebrews 8, verse 10. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their heart, and I will be to them a God, and they will be to me a people. He says, they shall not teach every man his neighbor, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me from the least to the greatest. I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. In that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. This promise of the new covenant talks of speaking down through time to a new relationship with God on the part of the house of Israel, the house of Judah, and their ability to enter back into that relationship at last with him. This comes from Jeremiah 31, and looking at it in the context of Jeremiah 31, it looks to me like this event is still further ahead of us. But on that night of the Last Supper, when Jesus gave his disciples the cup and says, Take this and drink it, it is my blood of the new covenant. From that time forward, the disciples of Jesus were in covenant with him. And this year, we come to Passover and we read through those verses that where Jesus talks to his disciples afterward. One thing we need to really watch as we read is for the obligations that fall upon us opposite the obligations that Christ has taken upon himself. For he does not leave us free of any obligation to the family. We have entered into a new family, and now we've got to begin to behave like that. Turning back to Second Chronicles, there is this marvelous scripture, which I, I, I always love you. There's a nice song, really, that's uh, been written from it. Second Chronicles, chapter 7, and verse 12. The Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. I have chosen this place, the temple, to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, if I command the locusts to devour the land, if I send a pestilence among the people, you know, if all these bad stuff comes upon you, perhaps this is a chastisement. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, heal their land. How can one be called by God's name? Well, the way in which we are, what an appellation that other people put upon us years ago, we are Christian. And when we carry the name of Christian, we are now his people called by his name. 
If we claimed in Old Testament times to be a worshiper of Jehovah, my God is centered in Jerusalem, his house is in Jerusalem, his name is Jehovah, I serve him, we are carrying his name with us wherever we go. We are in covenant. We have obligations. We have responsibilities which we must carry out. And when we fail to do so, we are despising his name. First Kings chapter 8, which is really, I think, about the same prayer, a different version. Chapter 8, verse 41. Moreover, concerning a stranger who is not of my people Israel, but comes out of a far country for my name's sake, he's heard of me. Clean over there in Asia, not just uh, the Turkey, Asia, but I mean all the way over to the beyond the Euphrates, has heard about my name, and he comes for my name's sake. For they shall hear of your great name and of your strong hand and your stretched out arm. When he will come and pray toward this house, Solomon asks, you hear from heaven your dwelling place, do according to all that the stranger calls to you for, that all the people of the earth may know your name, which is another way of saying know who you are, to fear you as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. I don't really think they put God's name on the doorposts in that house. It's just that everyone knew. This is the house of Jehovah. If your people go out to battle against their enemy, wherever they shall, you shall send them, and shall pray to the Lord toward the city which you have chosen, toward the house I have built for your name, then I will hear in heaven their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause. And I want to tell you, it brought tears to my eyes. When the latest version of the Iraq war was about to begin, and the reporters were embedded with the troops, so we really knew what they were doing. To see those men gathered together, bow their heads, or kneel on a knee, and pray and ask God, this God, to hear their prayer, to bless their cause, and to be with them. You know, this is something our armies have tended to do down through time. Did you know it was President Roosevelt who actually wrote the inscription that went inside a little New Testament? I don't know, have any of you ever seen one of those? It's a little New Testament pocket size that had a, a, a metal plate on one side of it, and soldiers carried it over their heart. And more than one of them saved his life when a bullet ricocheted off that plate. That New Testament, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, wrote the inscription on the inside of that, blessing the soldiers as they went into battle. I didn't know this until recently, but, but President Roosevelt led the nation in prayer over the radio in the early days of World War II. So he says, if my people call by my name will humble themselves, if they'll pray, if they'll ask me, I will intervene for them, I will maintain their cause, and look at how he has maintained our men's cause. The people there fighting in Iraq are cowards. They're cowards, but they're also not stupid. They know that they not, cannot defeat our armies in the open field of battle. Utterly impossible. They were rolled over in that war coming into Baghdad in the beginning. Just rolled over. I've never seen anything like that. And having read Tommy Frank's book, American Soldier, and realizing how he looks upon himself, that by American Soldier, he's talking about Tommy Franks. And to realize that the way in which he loved the men that he sent into battle and that these guys, he and all the rest of them, believe in God, believe he will maintain their cause, and that is the one that they look to. It's one of the reasons why we've been as successful as we have. It's not because of Congress. It's not because of our courts. It's because of those men that bear the rifle in our name and in the name of our God and go out and fight for us. In Revelation, there's a sequence of interesting statements. They're in the letters to the seven churches of Revelation. Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, writing to this church, he says, I know your works. I know you live where Satan's seed is, and that you hold fast my name, and have not denied my faith, even in those days when Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you. What he's saying is simply this. 
You didn't back off and say, no, I'm not a Christian. No, I, Jesus, who's that? No, no. No, in this day when it was worth your life to confess me, you didn't deny me. Revelation 2, verse 17. He that has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, to the winner, I will give with a hidden manner. I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written that no man knows, save he who receives it. Revelation 3, 8. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, and no man can shut it, because you have a little strength, you have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. And again, I don't think that's a question of the phonetic sound of his name he's talking about. You haven't denied who you are and who you worship. You haven't denied me, is what he's saying. And I tell you, in that day, in that age, it took some amount of faith to not deny Jesus. Revelation 3, verse 12. Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He will go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, New Jerusalem, that comes down out of heaven. And I will write upon him my new name. Don't know what that is. Just I just want it. Revelation 14, verse 1. I looked, and behold, a lamb stood on Mount Zion with him, 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, a voice of thunder, and the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the beasts, the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth, who had God's name. In their forehead. You know, he goes on, and there's, the, there's much more. But I come back to this prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What does it mean? I think it means that we who bear his name, whether it be dis- Christian, disciples of Jesus, followers of Yeshua, or whatever it is, that we carry ourselves as those who represent him in the world, that we act as though we were wearing a shirt that says Christian across the front of it everywhere we go, that we do not hide who we are. And it means then that we do not profane his name by the way we live, the way we deal with people, by our honesty, by our integrity. All these things show who we are and who we follow. And then, when you read and compare this with Exodus 20, verse 7, just the one verse, You shall not bear the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. When we got married, my wife took my name. When we enter into covenant with Jesus Christ, we take his name. And so he is saying, you shall not take that name in vain. It isn't just talking about profanity. <clears throat> and the NIV, I think, is wrong here when it says, you shall not misuse the name. I don't think that's the point. I think what he's saying is you do not take it in covenant when you're not prepared to live by it, which is why Jesus said, count the cost. Don't start on this battle unless you are prepared to give it everything you've got. You've got to be willing to hate father, mother, mother, brothers, sisters, and then he says, and your own life also. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. So, when we come to the Lord's Prayer, and we repeat, hallowed be thy name. These are not just some spiritual words that we're supposed to say. It really is a matter of to be hallowed God's name, in, your, in, in and by your life and the way you live it. That we accept the responsibility of carrying his name and doing honor to the family of God. You know, I know a lot of young people down through the years, they have oftentimes said that they couldn't do a given thing because they couldn't bring disgrace on their family. And man, what a tremendous upbringing that was. That they had so much loyalty to their family They would not do this thing that they were being called upon to do. 
And as Christians, we ought to feel the same way about our family. We have a covenant to honor with the one whose name we bear. And we also have a responsibility, also a covenant to honor with everyone else who bears that name as well. I not long ago saw in a new light this 12th chapter of Hebrews, verse 22, where Paul has said, you know, we haven't come to Mount Sinai. That's not what we've come to. He says in verse 22, you are coming to Mount Sion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. That expression, general assembly, is a peculiar Greek expression that actually reaches out and takes in the whole church anywhere, anytime, living or dead. We have a covenant relationship with men and women of faith from the first century, well, beyond the first century, from, from Abraham to our own day, to keep faith with one another. You have come to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are written in heaven, to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Perfect.